powerful worship and teaching out of Romans chapter 4 from Pastor Mike Hilson right here at New Life at Your House. Thanks for having New Life at your house. Here at New Life, we exist to help you love God and love people better every single day. And that's why we provide this online church experience that's made to fit really any environment like your living room or even the palm of your hand. We wanna help you make wherever you are into a place of worship. And we also wanna help you find creative ways to gather with others. We call them watch parties. It's really just you plus two. And we wanna give you coaching, training, whatever's necessary to help you reach your family and your friends and your community. And that's why Emily and I just feel like guests in yeah. your home uh, with you invited in to worship today. So thanks for having us. Yeah, and we do wanna thank you guys. You have been responding so much in the last couple of months as we've done different calls to action. So one of the things that we have felt convicted and, and like God was leading us too is yeah. to read scripture and build it into our daily rhythms but to do that together and that's something that we've been talking about for a while as bible groups but yeah. you guys have responded to that we have 284 users on the app <laughs> And awesome. in those groups, we have people that are actually sharing life together mm -hmm. and, um, and prayer requests all over the place about health issues, about kids, about, um, you know, sometimes celebrating things that are really cool miracles that are happening. Mm -hmm. And other times we're just celebrating when we have a good day. Mm -hmm. And so we get to really walk in pace of everyday life with the rest of the, our church that is living anywhere and mm -hmm. everywhere and, and everywhere. so we just want to thank you guys for those of you who have joined and we really hope that it has introduced that rhythm that daily rhythm of being with god and being with other people around his word has actually started to change your life maybe it started to change the way you think maybe it started to change i know it does for us when we read and we do that stuff together yeah um so we really are grateful that you're doing that and if you're interested if you're like hey i need that you can always sign up for bible groups mm -hmm. when you text nl YH Connect to the number 94,000. It's one of the mm -hmm. things that you can uh, click on that form. Yeah, and that's what we do as a church. We just really want to be able to help you grow in your faith, whatever way that is possible. And through, Even if you're at the beginning right. and not knowing what you believe, all the way up to if you've been a Christian forever. Yeah, and we, we definitely have that spectrum. Mm -hmm. We have some really seasoned saints, and we have mm -hmm. some people that are just trying to figure this all out. And mm -hmm. as an online church, you might wonder, like, how do we do that? And these are some of the ways that we've been able to grow together, mm -hmm. Bible groups, and then also our teams, right? Yeah, our Which teams pretty cool. are so much fun. Um, we love hanging out with, so with a in-person church, which mm -hmm. we are not, all of our in-person stuff is done through watch parties, done through maybe some groups that gather and serve together with those who watch as a part of New Life at Your House right. near them. But when you're in person, a lot of times volunteering can be help being church be put on, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, making Whereas, it happen, right. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas our volunteers, it's, it's more of looking at their life, their daily rhythms, what already exists, and how do we partner with you guys for God to use you in those spaces. So mm -hmm. if your kid plays sports, how do you introduce your faith and minister as you're yeah. on the sidelines, you know, watching a game? And so our volunteers, so we do have volunteers that help us put all of this on, like when we film, when we, you know, our worship team. But we also have volunteers who just are like, hey, I don't know if I can help you guys, or if maybe there's just some way that I could be doing more for God. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not more for this church. Maybe mm -hmm. it's how can we help you do more in your communities that mm -hmm. maybe aren't this church. Yeah, we have some people who are interested in helping with, you know, starting a new Bible group for mm -hmm. people that they know that might not be familiar yeah, with the larger group, you know, like all. they're like, wow, I don't want to be in a group with 85 yeah. people, but I'll be in a group with just you and mm -hmm. they're starting that so yeah. they can apply their faith in different realms of spheres of influence in their life. And we have other people who are starting watch parties and, and connecting people across the country through Zoom watch parties. So there's so many ways as a church that through New Life at Your House, you can get connected to grow in your faith, but also not just grow, but put your faith in action yeah. to see God transform 
your your life, but those around you as well. Yeah, That's we're what not. It's all about. We're really not supposed to do nothing with it. Yeah. If God has done something in our life, if He's changed us, if He's changing us, yep. we're supposed to do something with it. So we just wanted to take a second to to share with you guys. We don't always get to mm -hmm. call all of you, or you know, not all of you are on the team and get to hear all the cool right. things that God's doing. And we just wanted to take a second mm -hmm. and and assure you that you guys are the reason that God mm -hmm. is blessing this. Those of you who give, those of you who serve, those of you who even if we have no idea who you are, watch every week and then live differently because of how right, God right. talked to you. So Whether we can count it, quantify it or not, he's moving in really big ways. And I love that it's not just in one area, it's wherever we are, wherever yep. we're watching from. Yeah, and whenever. So I know a lot of you are catching this on the replay and I just hope that, you know, if you're thinking, I wanna get connected, I wanna do a next step, mm -hmm. I wanna find out how I can grow my faith or do more with my faith, then like Emma already said, text the number 94,000, the word, and NLYH Connect yeah. and we'll get you in touch with what's going on Absolutely. and how you can take a next step. But mm -hmm. we're about to begin, so I wanna just pray with you. We do this every week because we want you to get the most out of your experience today. Mm -hmm. We believe that regardless of when or where you're watching, God is in our midst. Mm -hmm. So let's pray now. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for how you've sent your son Jesus. And, and Jesus, we love you and acknowledge you today and are so grateful for all that you've done. We're looking forward to Easter coming up soon. Oh my gosh, it's coming up fast. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, people touch you know, just, just touch base with you for the first time maybe in a while or come to realize that they need you more in their life. But today as we sing, we just want to invite the Holy Spirit to just be with each and every person who's watching, each watch party. God, that you, Holy Spirit, would move powerfully in each mm -hmm. and every heart, that you would speak, that you would reveal, that you would help us take next steps and do the things that only you can call us to because you know what we need best. Mm -hmm. So we give it to you right now. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. All right, we'll see you after worship. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him for who he is, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the guitar and bass, I just added that, praise him with the timbrel and dancing, praise him with the strings and the drums and the clash of the cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
have nothing but joy. I have nothing but a song for you. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Hey, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord.
Across this room, can we say?
As always, we hope that your heart was touched by the songs and the sound of worship was able to fill wherever you are today, but it's time during our service now to shift into giving. And we do that as an act of worship every single week. And we just wanted you to know you can give now by texting the word generosity just to the number 94,000, just all one word generosity. And you'll get a text back. It'll have a link to give. And once you click on that, you can give any dollar amount. Of course, it's a totally up to you and between you and God, but we would suggest that this is your church to choose tithing, or if you can be a, become a partner today by setting up a recurring gift of any amount, or you could support with a one-time gift of any amount. So we just want to invite you to worship in that way today. Which we did see last week, we invited y'all to worship that way, mm -hmm. specifically giving to missions for Ukraine, partnering oh, with World crazy. Hope. Crazy, yeah, yeah, And yeah, yeah. all week we saw you guys come through sending texts, generosity, Some a lot of mm -hmm. people for the first time, maybe giving for the first yeah. time this way. And we, so how, much, how much money did we end up? Well, I mean, just on Sunday alone, um, we had over 42 people immediately text in and respond. Mm -hmm. And we saw, I think on just Sunday, 6,000 yeah. plus dollars come through, which is all going straight out to World Hope yeah. to help the people of Ukraine. So you guys are just awesome. Yeah, um, you guys are awesome in that. Yeah. <laughs> that's one week where we did set a specific target mm -hmm. of what that money would do in ministry, but weekly, day to day, it's right. the same thing. Maybe we're not giving it all away one week to, you you know something else but as you give to new life at your house you're still doing ministry like that right, it's right. still and and you guys are the thing that makes the everyday ministry happen here and all of the stories of life change you hear all of the new people that go to watch parties for the first time all of the people who just found it online somewhere had never have maybe never been to church before that is what your giving goes towards so mm -hmm. we wanted to celebrate what happened last week and also encourage that there's yeah. potential for God to do something crazy like that with your giving every week. Yeah, and it's just so, I, I gotta tell you, it's it's heartwarming. Like, mm -hmm. I know we were both really moved to hear that number, but it's really not even about just that number. I want you guys to know this, that when, like, with the Ukraine situation specifically, you're part of a global body of Christ, mm -hmm. that you are a, a large group of people that connect with, through this digital medium, but you're part of millions and millions, possibly billions of people around the globe that are making things happen in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that World Hope had a plane filled with supplies and they said that there were some $7 million collectively mm -hmm. that was given. And that's part of, that's yeah. part of that 7 million was your contribution. And that's the body of Christ, literally hundreds and thousands of churches all together to help these people. Yeah. So that's just so powerful. And I hope that scope encourages you that you might feel alone today sometimes, or you might feel like you're alone right now watching, or you might feel alone sometimes when it's just you praying and you're wondering what, what God's gonna do next in your life, mm -hmm. but you're part of something so much bigger. Yeah, for sure. That's We talk a lot about how do we how do we pray for and and be impactful to our world, the big picture of what's right. going on as well as in our world, in our homes and in our schools and in our workplaces. And that was just one way where we could kind of reach up and attach to the bigger picture. And God definitely used all of you to do that. But we are about to jump into our message. And before we do that, we wanna encourage you to stick around to the very end of the message because we have an exciting update about our kids' content. If you were here last week, you heard a little bit about it, but we, we want you to hear it again, hear the heart behind it and maybe sign up yourselves if you have kids or talk to the people you know who have kids and, and, and be able to explain to them why it's something that they should consider doing. But for now, we really hope that you enjoy the rest of the message. What's in your heart? What do you want? To be totally identified? To feel completely known? To be fully loved? You can have all of it, feel all of it, from His grace, His faithfulness, His word, His freedom. To know Him is to be known. Do you know Him?
Well, hey, y'all, welcome back to church, and thanks again for joining us for church. You know, I, I want to say it again. We say it all the time, but this is our church. This is a proper, normal church. I understand that the technology is different. I understand that we are gathering in, in a different setting, and perhaps you're in, a, you're in a home, or perhaps you're watching online. Oh, I understand the setting's different, but when we come together as the people of God, we are the body of Christ. We are a church, and I just want to I just want to encourage you to remember that when we come together like this, we're all in the same place, and we are all servants of God. This is our church. Now, having said that, one of the things that I've, I've been amazed at how similar uh, the, the church is in this setting as to what it's been throughout my career. And one of the things that we've always struggled with is the difference between taking care of and training kids when they're at church versus equipping parents to be the spiritual leaders of their house. This is not a, a different problem or a different concern in this setting. And so we're going to have a shift in the way we do children's ministry because we want to empower you to be the spiritual leaders of your children and of your household and be the spiritual mentors your children need. Listen, let me be very honest. When kids go somewhere else and speak to someone else about how to follow Christ, then they believe the experts on how to follow Christ are someone other than you. What we really need them to see is you as the spiritual leader of your house. So what we're going to do, starting in April, first Sunday in April, so just a couple weeks from now, what we're going to do is we're going to stop having children's ministry follow immediately and naturally after the sermon. Instead, what we're going to do is uh, calm down. Calm down. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have tools and resources for you that you can download and have available so that at any point during, after, or any point during the week, you can use them as tools to lead your children into a deeper walk with Christ, an understanding of who Jesus is. Now, in order to get these tools, all you need to do is sign up. And in order to sign up, all you've got to do is you need to text the letters N L Y H Kids, N L Y H Kids, to the number 94,000. If you will text NLYH Kids to the number 94,000, we will register you to receive all of the materials necessary for you to run a children's ministry wherever you are. And when you do that, you will become the spiritual director, the spiritual mentor that your kids and maybe, maybe the rest of your family's kids, whoever else is gathering with you, you can become the spiritual mentor to them. And you could do that at any point during the week you want to. You're not trapped in our schedule. You're not, you're not stuck with our teachers. It's all the tools we give to you so that you can be the one that leads your kids. So I want to encourage you to do that. Text NLYH Kids to the number 94,000, and we will register you to have all of the materials necessary to run your own children's ministry. So today, we're still in, we're still in the book of Romans, and we are in chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we're going to start with verse 1, and, and I, I just want to read this, and then I want to take a minute. Y'all stay with me. I, I'm going to go through a little, there's going to be a little history lesson here, but trust me, it won't take long. It won't be that painful. Stay with me. You'll be all right. Okay, here we go. So Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Now, let, let's, let's unpack, because, because in the next few chapters, Paul's going to talk a lot about Abraham. So let's unpack the question, why are we talking about Abraham at all? We are, we are, we are hundreds, if not a thousand years removed from Abraham at this point. And so why are we talking about him at all? Well, here's, here's the reason. The reason we're talking about Abraham is that in order for Paul, stay with me, in order for Paul to deconstruct what the Jewish world around him understood as the proper way to approach and receive forgiveness from God, in order for him to deconstruct that teaching, he needs to go back to the beginning and show something. You're going to see him in, this, in these verses lay the groundwork that he is going to use in the next few chapters to, to say, hey, here's how we found forgiveness over the past however many years since Abraham, since Moses, since the Mosaic Law. I understand that. But that's not how it worked with Abraham. 
They've been following the Mosaic law. This is Moses who brings the children out of, the, out of Egypt and establishes the law in, in Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Uh, but he says, wait, let me take you all the way back to how it should work, and how it should work is how it worked with Abraham. You say, you say but, but, but again, why do we have to go all the way back to the beginning to fix things? Because truth is set at the beginning of a people group. Truth is set, and that truth, if it is to be altered, must be altered from its birthplace so that you can understand the thinking all the way through because God has a purpose. God had Abraham find a relationship with him, had Abraham follow him, took Abraham through all of these choices, decisions, challenges, all of that, and established nations, not just a nation, but nations out of Abraham, and what God did with Abraham set the tone. You must never forget the shoulders you are standing on because those shoulders, those shoulders are leading you in a given direction. And if those shoulders lead you in the right direction, that's one thing. If they lead you in the wrong direction, that's a different thing. You, if, in order to understand, y'all, 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 in order to understand wh where you are and how you got there, you're going to have to unpack reality back to where you started. This is true in every relationship, not just your relationship with God or cultural, societal relationships. This is what I have to do if I, when I used to do, don't do counseling anymore. But when I used to do counseling, uh, I would have to go all the way back to the beginning. One of the first thing I wanted a couple to do when they came to me for marital counseling is I want to go back to when you started dating. When you fell in love, why? Why did you fall in love? Why was this? What was the beginning point of this? And when they begin to unpack that, you're going to find you're going to find that the reasons they loved each other are still there, or you're going to find that the reasons that they fell in love with each, with each other were weak from the beginning. And now you begin to understand what it is you can build on and what it is you need to fix. That's precisely what what Paul is doing here. He's going back to the beginning to say, look, I want to show you something. When you do that, you learn what Scripture has to say, not just about Abraham, but about you. Because Scripture speaks into who you are. It always does, because God created us all. Therefore, when, God is, when, when we are learning something about how God dealt with Abraham, we are learning something about how God dealt with us. When we are learning something about how God dealt with the nation of Israel, we learn something about how God will deal with us as an individual. We learn about how God will deal with us as a nation. When we learn about how God dealt with the ancients, we learn about how God will deal with and is dealing with the moderns. Because we think, y'all, stay with me, we think we're all that and a side of chips because we've developed all this much and we're so far advanced and all of that, but we ain't no different than our forefathers. Because all human beings want the same things and have the same challenges. Sin is the issue. Sin is the issue. And Jesus is the answer. It's always been that way. Sin is the issue and finding forgiveness in God is what we've got to do. Now Paul is going to begin to unpack that. Now as a result of understanding the shoulders we stand on, taking us back to Abraham, as a result of knowing what scripture has to say about us, because all throughout the Old Testament we learn that, what now should I do with what I am learning? As we are learning what we are in the book of Romans, listen to me, if I just teach you the book of Romans, and you get to where you can quote it, and you can explain it, and you can understand it, and you can talk to people about it, but you don't do anything with it, what good is it? You've got to know what you are going to do with this scripture, and not just know it, but live it and be it. Let it move inside of you and let it change you. That's where scripture takes hold. So, what then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter, this matter of forgiveness, this matter of righteousness? Watch what he says next. Verse 2. What then shall we say, well, same verse. What sh then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, watch what he's doing. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, let me pause, justified, made just as if I'd never sinned. So made right again. God justifies us. When I come to Jesus and he forgives me, I am made just as if I'd never sinned. I'm justified. So what in, if, in fact, Abraham was justified 
by works. What does that mean? It means that what if, if, if in fact Abraham was, was justified, made right by his own working, by his own doing, by something he accomplished, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. He had something to be proud of, but not before God. Not before God, because God is above everyone else. God is greater than everyone else. What does scripture say? It says Abraham, notice, notice by the way, Paul goes back to the Old Testament, pulls up their scriptures and says, look at what it says. Paul is not, everybody listen to me. Paul is not arguing his opinion. Americans, can I, can I just talk to you just a minute? We've got to stop acting like our opinions create fact. They just don't. They just don't. Your opinion, my opinion, nobody's opinion creates fact. Fact creates fact. But when we act like opinions are facts, that's how you end up with cults that kill and destroy people. That's how you end up with political leaders that can, that can take their nations and do unheard of, unseemly things with their armies because they've taken the opinion of a person and they've acted like it's fact. You've got to, that, that can't be. You, fact has to be fact. And you say, oh, hey, Pastor Mike, you're going way too far. Really? Really? Do you realize that the Nazis and Hitler convinced their entire people that Jewish people were not humans, but were insect, instead insects and rats? Look, fact is they're humans, just like everybody else. Everything about it said human. But the Nazis convinced their people that they, they weren't. This has happened multiple times throughout hi human history. We cannot operate in opinion. We must operate in fact. And, and Paul goes back to scripture to say, I'm not just giving you my opinion. Look at what the history says. Look at what has been said. Look at what has been true. The scripture says, this is why we ought to, we ought to go back to the Bible. The Bible has been around for 2,000 years, the New Testament portion, the Old Testament portion. Some of it's been around for, for 3,500 years. You know, so the Bible's been around all these years. There's truth in there. There's time-honored, tested truth in there that we need to step back and say, I'm, I'm standing on an authority other than just myself. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox now. So <clears throat> that, what does Scripture say about this? Here's what Scripture says. Abraham believed God. Watch. Abraham believed God, faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was credited to him as righteous. And that, that's a big deal. Righteousness is being right in the presence of God. He believed that's about faith. So Abraham's faith ends up in righteousness, but how? Not because of his works, but because it was credited to him. This is Abraham. This is Genesis. This is all the way back in the beginning. So, so it was credited to him. Now watch, it, Paul makes an argument here. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. If you come and work, if I make an agreement with you and I say, okay, I'm gonna pay you $20 an hour, you're gonna do da 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 and you're gonna work for 10 hours. When you're done with your 10 hours, I owe you 200 bucks, okay? I'm not crediting you 200 bucks out of the goodness of my heart. No, you earned that 200 bucks, and if I don't pay you, I'm stealing. I become a thief if I don't pay you for your labor. Okay, so that's, that's, just, that's just the way it is. However, if, you say, if I find out you need 200 bucks and I just come and I give you 200 bucks because it's out of the goodness of my heart, that is now credited to you, not from your works, but because of my generosity. You see how that works? What is being said here is that, that Abraham did not, through his works, earn this justification Abraham, it was credited to him because of his faith. To everyone who works, the wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, watch, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, takes those who are not like God, and makes them just as if they'd never sinned so they can be like God, their faith is credited as righteousness, is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. You see what he just did? He went back to two of the 
the largest leaders in the history of Jewish of Jewish of the Jewish people. He goes back to Abraham, the founder. He goes back to David, the greatest king. And he points out in both cases they talk about a righteousness that is credited to people. The truth is God credits to us our watch. Our salvation, this is where Paul is getting, our salvation comes through faith, not through works. What, therefore, should we do with this? How, therefore, should we act on this? Let me show you this. We should, in light of this, focus on our belief in God, our faith, instead of trying to impress God. See, I, th I think what some people are trying to do is they're trying to earn their salvation. And they're trying to earn their salvation by being as good as they can. Basically, what they're saying is, I need to be good enough to get into heaven. And so they're trying to do enough just to impress God just enough that when it comes to judgment, God will let them into heaven. Look, y'all, y'all, they're trying to impress the world just enough, be good just enough that the world will look at them and say, oh, wow, you're an example of what it means to be righteous. You're an example of what it means to be like God. I've talked to people who believe this way, and they believe that somehow they're gonna earn everybody's good graces. Now, don't get me wrong, we gotta work to earn people's good graces, but you cannot, in the end, earn forgiveness. You cannot, in the end, earn righteousness. You cannot, in the end, look, you might be able to impress your neighbor enough to earn their respect. Everybody's got that? But there's nothing you can do to impress God. God is the God of heaven. He is greater than everything else. He is above everything else. He is more holy than you or I could ever imagine. And our right, the Bible says this, our righteousness is as filthy rags in his presence. There's, there, there, we just can't impress our way to God. And, and listen, I'm not suggesting, everybody, everybody listen to me. I am not suggesting we don't try to do good and be good. We must constantly try to do good and be good. I'm telling you, that's never going to be enough. And if you try to count on that, you're going to get discouraged because you're going to fail. And all of a sudden you're going to say, wow, I'm not as good as I thought. I'm not as cool as I thought. I'm not as righteous as I thought. I'm not as holy as I thought. I failed when I should have this, I, that. And that's going to happen to everybody. When that happens, watch, if your righteousness is based on your works, you just lost your paycheck, all right? But if your righteousness is based on your faith and God's kindness, you didn't lose anything because God is going to carry you through that. We must, as a result of, of all of this, focus on our belief in God instead of trying to impress God. Y'all, can I be very honest with you? People who spend, groups, and I know, I know some of them, groups who spend their lives trying to impress God, trying to prove their holiness by, by, by their actions, trying to prove their holiness by the clothes they wear or the way they cut their hair, or trying to prove their holiness constantly, constantly, they, they end up being very bitter. They end up being, listen, everybody, everybody hear me. Uh, you, you gotta hear me out. Most people in these groups truly don't do the sinful things they're preaching against. Some do, and they make the news, and everybody then thinks everybody's like that. That's not true. Most of these hyper-conservative groups, hyper-legalistic uh, uh, groups, they actually live what they say they believe. They, they, they ain't touched a drop of the devil's juice in years. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's all these things. They, they, they follow all these rules, and they're sincere about it. But they end up bitter and angry because, frankly, they've stolen all of the joy out of life in order to try to prove something that they can't prove anyway. They're trying, to, they're trying to prove themselves to God. When God is in heaven looking at them, I don't think God's ready to throw them into hell. Don't anybody get me wrong. I think God's looking at them and saying, oh, my child, you don't have to do that. I already love you. I want you to be good. I want you to work at being better. I want you to improve. I want you to be righteous. I want you to follow my laws. I want you to do all of that. But none of that creates or deletes my love for you. My love for you is from the beginning. So listen to me, what do we do with that? We gotta focus on our belief, our faith in God, and 
instead of trying to impress God. The next verse says this, 7 and 8. Blessed are those, I, I, I love verses like this. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Come on now. Somebody needs an, in, at least an internal amen on that one. Thank God for who he is and the way he forgives us. Look, we need to focus, we need to focus on, our, on our belief in God, our faith, rather than in trying to impress God. But we also need to focus on our forgiveness instead of our righteousness. Now, I want you to hear me. Hear me out. Again, I am not suggesting that we do not need to try to be righteous. I'm not suggesting that life is not a daily battle to do what is right instead of what is wrong. All of that is true. Life is a struggle. Life is a battle. We must be battling to do right and not do wrong. We must constantly be working to follow Christ. However, we must understand that what we focus on is our forgiveness. You know why that matters? When I focus on forgiveness, my forgiveness, it's awfully hard to look at you as a nasty heathen pig dog sinner when I'm focused on how much God already forgave me. The truth is, the, when we focus on our righteousness, if I follow this pattern, I want to impress God with my righteousness. And just for a moment, let's say that I'm convinced that I am succeeding in impressing God with my righteousness. Just for a moment, let's say I'm convinced of that. What does that make me? It makes me bitter because I'm now, the only thing I'm focused on is what I can't do. Don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. So my life is not fun at all. But secondly, it makes me haughty. It makes me arrogant because I now am convinced that I, through my own ability, my own strength, have become better than you. And I did it myself. It makes me arrogant. And I got to tell you, there's, y'all, y'all, the church is filled with pompous, prideful people who believe they've become so pure that they're better than everybody else. And that's just not true. It's just not. Now, uh, it, it is, <laughs> stay with me, stay with me, hear me out. I'm going to get misquoted, I know I am. But stay out. Following Christ is better than not following Christ. Okay, there's a better and there's a worse. Following Christ is a better choice. Following what Jesus told you to do will make your life better. Amen. Okay, not even going to lie about it. And it'll give you better outcomes than other people. But it does not make you better than, as an individual, another human being. You know why? Jesus died for all human beings. All of them. Jesus died for the worst nasty heathen pig dog center you know. Jesus died, and Jesus is drawing that person to himself right now. And if your prideful purity drives them away from Jesus, you're not being righteous, you're being sinful. You see, but if you focus on your own forgiveness... Instead of your righteousness, still pursuing righteousness, still wanting righteousness, still trying to be like Christ, but focused on our forgiveness. If I am focused, watch, on my faith and my forgiveness, the faith that God has given me the capacity to have in him and the forgiveness God has credited to me. Not that I earned, not that he owed me, but that he credited to me. If I'm focused on my faith and my forgiveness, I, there's no room in there to become so prideful that I turn other people off. Amen. You know why? Because, I, y'all, because I'm a nasty heathen pig dog center that God pulled up out of the mud and cleaned up and changed from the inside out so that I now don't have to crawl back in the mud and become the same old nasty heathen pig dog center I was before, not because I'm strong or I'm smart or I'm cool or I'm good, but because he is all that and more. Amen. That's who God is. And that's what God wants us to focus on. And it is no, di stay with me, it, <laughs> it's not new. It's precisely what God did with Abraham. It's as old as Genesis. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here, let me, let, me, let, me, let me make sure we close the loop. Therefore, when I believe God, I have faith in God, salvation is credited to me as righteousness. And then because Jesus makes that change in my life, 
Because Jesus makes that change in my life, because by faith he credits righteousness, I gain the strength through his grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to begin living a different and better life, not because of anything in me, but because of everything of him that has now moved into me. In my, in, in, in my sinful flesh, Paul writes, there is nothing good except the God who lives in me. Y'all, we've got to understand that our pursuit of God must be like the pursuit that was in Abraham. It is by our faith that we find forgiveness. And when we focus on the faith and the forgiveness, we can reach the world around us with a God who will give them the exact same faith and forgiveness he gave to us. So let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak right now. I want to pray, Lord, specifically toward two groups of people. I want to pray, Lord, toward those who do not yet know your forgiveness. And Lord, what I want to ask, what I want to ask you to do, Holy Spirit, is to guide them into a faith that will trust you to credit in them a righteousness, forgive them, and make them your children. Lord, we've said it so many times, just praying the ABCs, I admit I need Christ. I believe Jesus can and will forgive me, and I commit my life to following him from this day forward. Lord, if we could just pray that little prayer and mean it, then, Lord, you would credit us with righteousness because of our faith and then give us strength, Holy Spirit, to live differently going forward, to be yours instead of controlled by the world. Lord, I'd like to pray for another group. And I'd like to pray for their deliverance as well. Been delivered from sin, now Lord, deliver us from legalism. Lord, for anybody that, under the sound of my voice, this just believed and been taught in their lives that they have to somehow earn the love of Christ or earn the, 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 the presence of God in their lives, Lord, take that out of us. Let us strive every day to be more righteous and more like you. Let us strive for goodness and holiness. But Lord, let us understand that what we rest in is your grace. So let us by faith receive the righteousness that is credited and then build from there. Keep us from legalism and keep us from arrogance. Let us instead understand that we are your children by your choice. Father, we, we praise you. Let us lean on you and just like Abraham, let us follow a God that the rest of the world may not understand, but who will take us to a promised land of who we were always meant to be. And Lord, we will give you praise for everything you do. In your name we pray, amen. There's just something powerful about scripture, like just going mm -hmm. verse by verse. I've been yeah. loving the series, I've been loving Romans. Um, and this week was really interesting for me because I often forget about how many people have come before. Mm -hmm. And even in the Bible, we're talking about a span of what? 6,000 years, right. four to 6,000 years, best we can tell from the beginning to the to the end of the book. And you have the Apostle Paul referring to Abraham and he's talking about this guy who lived probably at least 2,000 years before the time he's writing. Mm -hmm. And all of them now are 2,000 years behind us. So all of these people have lived out this faith and yeah. have walked and we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants. It's yeah. kind of crazy. It's really uh, what I love about this message or even just this, the way that Pastor Mike is bringing us through Romans this year is that I couldn't make the connections that he can help us make mm -hmm. even when in scripture, when, um, when scripture references scripture and going there and then knowing what's going on there and then being able to stay, like Pastor Mike does such a good job of walking us through mm -hmm. the relevance of Abraham to, to Paul, to Jesus, right. to Paul, and then to us and what it actually has to do with our everyday life. So mm -hmm. we would just encourage you guys to be able to unpack whoever you're watching with. And if you're not, this is why we find it so important that you do find someone to have a watch party with so that you can unpack what is God saying to you right now? Mm -hmm. What was relevant about that scripture that God wants to invade and integrate into your everyday life and maybe yeah. he needs to say to your heart? Yeah, well, at, at the very least, we hope that 
you've had a takeaway, that yeah. there's something that you know you need to do or that you're inspired in some way to take a next step mm -hmm. in your faith. We have a bunch of options. We mentioned some earlier about texting um, the word generosity, yeah. for example, to 94,000. And we mentioned that if this is your church, we wanted to invite you to be a tither, mm -hmm. which is giving your first 10% of your income. And that's what the Bible just lays out as our guideline to give back to God what is first his. Yeah. Um, but if you're not ready to tithe, or maybe you go to another church full-time, that's your church, but you want to support us in some way, mm -hmm. you can do that by becoming a partner and setting up some sort of regular donation per week. Um, some people do like $25 as an yeah. example, but you, any amount you want to make you feel like you're, you're supporting us at the level you like, or you could become one of our many supporters with a one-time gift of mm -hmm. any amount and do that as often as you want. Yep. But regardless of what option you choose, we just want you to know we're grateful for your giving and your partnership because mm -hmm. you literally help Help the everyday impact of our church be possible. So yeah. we just appreciate that so much. Yeah, we do pray, like we said, that you were able to hear from God today through New Life at your house and that you're leaving equipped to love him and people better today and tomorrow, that it actually changes your week, your day-to-day, right. -day, your day-to-day -day life. But again, thank you for your giving. You make the everyday impact of this church possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we just want to make sure that you're connecting with us in every way possible. As you know, we're on YouTube. You might be watching on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're also on our website. So if you are on YouTube, find us. New Life is our name. You'll see our little logo. Mm -hmm. Subscribe. Make sure that you're getting all of our videos as a notification. Turn on your notifications if you have them on, um, don't have them on already. And then you can go to our website and save it as a favorite, watch.newlife.live. But one great way to get connected on a regular basis, and I know a lot of you have already done this, but we're still seeing new people all the time, jump into our Facebook community. Mm -hmm. We have first dibs there about special announcements, live streams with yeah. Pastor Emily, Pastor Mike, Pastor Curtis and I, and uh, we just wanna make sure you're connected to all that so you don't miss anything that we have going on. We're about to go into our kids' service, so if you have kids, we encourage that you gather them around right now to watch. But starting next week, if you wanna have New Life Kids Church at your house, then this announcement is really important for you because we have been broadcasting just like this, like what we're about to do. To best serve and reach the next generation though, we started to pray and think about what would that look like? And we believe that that would be parents actually signing up your family to receive that content. The reason being that we believe kids are best led in, it, kids, all of us, are best yeah. led into an understanding of who Jesus is through relationship with him. Yeah. And so instead of just having the content and watching it, we wanna give you the content, give you resources that go along with that content, like discussions and mm -hmm. games, and, and as well as, community with other parents who are in the same phase as you and your family. And so then you'll be able to play the content for them, talk with them about it, and it really become a part of how you parent. Yeah. And so when you do that, you'll be invited to an orientation, you'll register, and you'll be a part of this orientation where it might not be a commitment yet, but you can just hear about it. And you'll hear about the strategy where you can provide your kids this ministry experience. So we want you to text uh, NLYH kids, mm -hmm. right? To the number 94,000. And when you do that, go to the registration, go ahead and sign, sign up and be expecting to hear from us to invite you to that orientation. And then if you do commit, you'll be a part of our monthly VIP nights where you can talk with other parents who are also trying to raise their kids up in faith, which I know is was really important for me to have something to stand on, even if I swayed, even if I wasn't always you know, claim to be a Christian throughout my childhood, that as I grew up, I had that to lean back on. Right. And so we just believe it's really important. We believe that it's gonna be really impactful to move that into your relationship with your kids and not just something that you watch together, but something you talk about, something you do. Yeah, well, we hope you take that next step and that's all for us this yeah. week, right? All right, well, yeah. we love you guys. We'll see you next week. See you next week.
Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Janae, and I'm so glad to be here with you this week. We are digging into some amazing stories this month. Last week, we got to hear the story of Ruth. Ruth was married to the son of Naomi. When her husband died, she went with Naomi to make sure she was taken care of. Ruth took good care of Naomi and had faith in God. Because of that, God blessed Ruth. Ruth got married to a man named Boaz. He was a good man who followed God. And they had a son named Obed. And Obed had many sons, but his youngest son was named David. And that David would go on to become king of Israel. This month, we said we are going to look into three stories, a queen, a mother of kings, and a prophet with a crazy vision. We heard about Esther, the queen who saved her people. Last week, we heard about Ruth, the mother of Israel's kings. This week, we're going to hear about Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet who had a crazy dream. But you'll have to listen to our story to learn more about Ezekiel. However, before we listen to the story, it's time to watch the game. This week, our game is called Marshmallow Bob. Our players will have to bob for apples. After they get an apple, they have to bob for marshmallows in a bowl of flour. The first person to get two apples and two marshmallows wins. Let's see what happens. All right, Manny, you ready to do this? Yes, sir. All right, in three, two, one, go! Pick that out. <laughs> <laughs> I win. Ow! I got two and two, bro. Check. One, two, one, two. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Are y'all ready? Y'all ready? Yeah. Let's play! Woo! We're not stopping. Get in the, the party's stopping. Get in the 
After many years of rebellion and idolatry, God allowed his people, the Israelites, to be taken captive by the empire of Babylon. This was a dark and discouraging time for the Israelites. Their temple, land, and nation had been lost. It was during this time that God gave an incredible vision of hope and new life to a prophet named Ezekiel. In Ezekiel's vision, the Spirit of the Lord carried him to the middle of a valley filled with dry bones that were scattered all over the place. As the Spirit of the Lord led Ezekiel through this valley of bones, God asked him, Can these bones live again? Ezekiel responded, O oh, Sovereign Lord, only you know the answer to that. Then God told Ezekiel to speak a message of prophecy to the dry bones that surrounded him, saying, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. I will put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and skin on you, and you will return to life. When I breathe new life into you, then you will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel spoke just as the Lord commanded. And as Ezekiel said the words of God's prophecy, a great rattling sound filled the valley. The bones of each body came together and connected themselves to form complete skeletons. As Ezekiel watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, and then skin formed over the bodies. But there was no breath in them. There was no life in these bodies. Then God commanded Ezekiel to speak a prophecy to the winds by saying, Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies that they may live again. As Ezekiel spoke these words, breath came into their bodies, and they all came to life. There in this valley, a vast army of living men stood before Ezekiel. Then God explained to Ezekiel that the bones in the valley represented the people of Israel, dried up out of hope and out of life. Then God told Ezekiel to prophesy to Israel, O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to rise. I will bring you out of captivity and back to the land of Israel. God gave Ezekiel this final message to prophesy for his people. When you return, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again. You will return home to your own land. The Lord told Ezekiel to tell the people of Israel that when this all comes to pass, they will know that it was the Lord who caused these things to happen and that the Lord had fulfilled his word. After many warnings from the Lord, the land of Israel was conquered by the Babylonians. The Israelites were taken prisoner and removed from their homeland. While in captivity, the people lost all hope in ever returning. The Lord gave the prophet Ezekiel a vision of a valley filled with dry bones. The Lord told Ezekiel to prophesy over the dry bones, telling them that the Lord will bring life back into them. As Ezekiel spoke the words the Lord gave him, a rattling sound filled the valley as the bones began to come together, forming skeletons. The skeletons were then covered in flesh, but the bodies had no life in them. The Lord told Ezekiel to prophesy over the lifeless bodies again, this time telling them that the Lord would fill them with breath. As Ezekiel prophesied to them, they were filled with breath. The vision was meant for the people of Israel, dried up of all hope. Through this vision, the Lord was promising to fill them with life and hope again through His Spirit. God promises that there will be a new covenant between Him and His people, the Israelites, in which He will give them a new heart and a new spirit. He promised to put His Spirit in them. The Israelites are not the only ones who benefit from this new covenant with God. 
All who believe in Jesus Christ can be forgiven of their sins and have a relationship with God. That's our bottom line for today. All who believe in Jesus can be forgiven of their sins. That includes you too. If you want to know more about Jesus forgiving your sins, ask a leader or an adult. I know they would love to talk to you about Jesus. So I've got a few questions for you guys to go over. First, how are the Israelites like the dried up bones? What was God's message or the new covenant to the Israelites? How do we get to be a part of the new covenant? All right, take a few minutes to talk these over.